Hello everyone and welcome back to Particles in a Box. Today we are going to be doing two-dimensional motion problems. Uh, so in the last episode we talked about two-dimensional motion, uh, we did some examples, but now we're going to tackle some flow fridge problems um, that are multiple steps. And I think that this episode is going to be really enjoyable for, for everybody of all skill levels. There's some problems that are a little bit more introductory and a little bit more surface level, but there are also some problems where you can find yourself going down a rabbit hole for hours and hours and uh, ending up with some interesting results. So I think that um, I think that everybody will have something to enjoy out of this episode. Um, so let's see what we have on the docket here today. Uh, so first problem, um, before I get started with this, again, uh, when I put these up on the screen, feel free to pause the video, read through them, you can try them yourself. Otherwise, if you just want to enjoy the show, uh, you can just follow along with me as, as I go through how um, how you would approach solving these problems. So pro problem number one, a rock is thrown upward from level ground so that the maximum height is equal to the range. At what angle is the rock thrown? What is the maximum range if the rock is thrown at the same speed but at the angle for maximum range? Okay, um, so the first part, what angle is the rock thrown? Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to find when is the maximum height, h, equal to the maximum range, okay? And so to do that, we just set r is equal to h, and we set them equal. And when we do some algebra, we end up getting that this sign is gonna cancel at one power of this sign, these g's are gonna cancel, uh, these v squareds are gonna cancel, we multiply the two over, so we're gonna get v cosine is equal to the sine. Um, you can divide by cosine, sine divided by cosine is tangent. So you're gonna get four is equal to the tangent of theta. And so then you take the inverse tangent or the arc tangent and of, of four, and that gives us our angle. Um, so it's about 76 degrees or about 1.33 radians uh, is what the tangent inverse of four is, okay? So when we launch a projectile at that angle, the maximum height is equal to the maximum range. That's neat. Um, so then part B is, what is the maximum range if the rock is thrown at the same speed, but at the angle for maximum range? So if you recall um, from the previous episode, the maximum range is when we fire our projectile at 45 degrees, okay? Uh, that is going to give us our maximum range. So our R max is equal to when we plug in theta 45. And then our uh, what, what we're gonna consider our starting R um, is going to be when we use theta s, okay? And so we want to find some multiplier times our initial r that gives us r max, is what we're going to try to find, and we're going to call that coefficient q, okay? Um, so q is going to be equal to r max over r, so we plug in our r max, we divide it by r, and so it turns out right that the g's are going to cancel, the v squareds are going to cancel, and we're going to be left with the sine of 45 times the cosine of 45 over the sine of theta s times the cosine of theta s. And so it turns out when you plug this in your calculator and you use the values up here for theta s, you get a two and one eighth. Um, so it's, it's, it's very weird that it actually comes out to be an exact answer. Um, that was honestly quite shocking that you would get an exact answer. Uh, seemingly you have, you have such a nasty angle measurement. Um, but it turns out that it is two and one eighth. So 2.125 times our initial range um, is going to give us the maximum range for this projectile. So we're gonna do a quick double check. Um, did we answer, so what angle is the rock thrown? It was that 75-ish degrees. And then what is the maximum range if the rock is thrown at the same speed, but at the angle for maximum range? Um, so the maximum range is 2.125 times the initial initial range. Um, so next problem. A fighter fighter, a distance D from a building, directs a stream of water at angle theta towards the building from the ground with some initial velocity. At what height h will the water make contact with the building? Um, oh, boy. oh gosh, that is not what I wanted to have happen. Okay, so here we are. Uh, so over here on the left, right, I've got a little bit of a drawing, okay? 
And so that's it, it looks pretty bare bones. So let's, let's fill it in with some of the variables, uh, variables from a problem, right? So this uh, distance right here is h. Okay, this is going to be the height of our building. And then over here, right, we have some angle theta, right? And then we launch this at some initial velocity v sub i. Okay, and our distance d is this distance all the way over here to the end, right, where this thing comes down. Okay, so. Uh, so we labeled our variables. We now we now know what's going on there. So in order to find the maximum height, um, we need to figure out the time that it's going to take to get the projectile over here. Okay, and to do that, we can use an expression in the x direction. Um, so d d is the horizontal distance, right? It's not the total distance, the horizontal distance. So we can use our formula for the position in the x direction to solve for the time. Okay, time is constant in both x and y. T is the same variable in the x and y equations. So we can do this. And then we can take this time and we can plug it into our y equation. Okay. Um, the reason why we can't, so this is a good example of when you can't use the range equation, right? Our initial y position is not the same as our final y position. So the range equation that we derived is not going to work. Okay. So you're going to have to do more work. And this is a good example of that. Um, so we know what our time is. And so we can plug that in um into our equation right and we know that our final y position is h okay um and our initial y position we we, we start at zero zero over here so um this is this is the origin over here and so when you plug that in um and you expand everything out you get some what interesting looking expression okay so you might be thinking like, okay, so that's, so that's great. Um, is there something more to this? And the answer is, is that there sort of is, right? One thing that you need to recognize is that for some values of V, D, and theta, and it's certain, in certain combinations of those values, the height that you get is going to be negative. Okay. Um, and how, how is that possible? Right? Well, Okay, so we use the time d over here, right? But if my initial velocity is really low or my angle is really big, right? My projectile could look something like this, right? Where I'm actually getting to this distance d, but my height is actually down here, right? Like using v, d, and theta, it is possible for me to have a path that looks like this, okay? And... You're, you would have a negative height here, right? And, and that answer wouldn't make sense, right? Like your stream of water would never actually get to the building. It would hit the ground before it ever got to your building, right? So you need to recognize that, okay, that's right, right, right there, there is this. The other thing that you can recognize from this as a little bit of a bonus problem to follow up with is that if you, if you plug in zero here for H, can you show that D is equal to our range equation? Hint, it, it is possible to do this. Um, I'm not going to do it here. That's something that you can try on your own. Um, but you can show, but you can drive the range equation from this. Um, so it's kind of a third way to get the range equation. Um, we use the horizontal. We use the time it took to get to the maximum height. We use the uh, y, uh, solving for time using y and plugging that back into x. And then now we sort of used the time for x and plugging it into y. Um, so you know, a couple, so, so there's a few things, right, from this problem, right? First of all, how do we find um, the, like, how do, how can we possibly find the range when we're not at the same initial y as we are for the final y? Um, and how sometimes we get an expression, but that expression isn't necessarily going to be applicable in all situations, right? There are some, like, hidden solutions um, that we need to be aware of, okay? Um, so moving on to the next problem, um, we have a kicker. Um, so for those of you who maybe aren't, who are international, maybe aren't um, um, acquainted with American football, um, maybe go look up a video of a, of a kicker kicking a field goal and you'll better understand uh, what, what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so a kicker is attempting a field goal. The goal posts are 36 meters away and the crossbar is three meters off the ground. Assuming the kicker has the correct aim, if the ball is kicked at 20 meters per second at an angle of 55 degrees, 
will the kicker be successful? Or in other words, will they get the ball above the crossbar um, and successfully complete the field goal? Okay. So first of all, we want to draw a picture, right? So the first thing is, is that you'll notice I've got two curves, right? So it's like, well, why do you have two curves, right? So this curve here, right, is the path of the ball, right? Which is all great, right? And it ends up three meters off of the ground, okay? But that's going to make our problem more difficult um, if we do it that way. So what we're going to do is we're just going to shift the whole thing down three meters, okay? So that our ending is now at zero, uh, at zero meters, and our initial is at minus three meters, okay? The exact same problem, it just makes our lives a little bit easier, okay? So what we can do is we know we can then use a position for our y final, okay? So we know that the final position in y is going to be equal to our usual expression, and then we got the minus three in there, okay? Because uh, we're not starting at zero. Uh, we know our x expression, okay? We're going to solve for the time like we have so many times using our x expression because it's nice and easy. And so then what we want to do, right, is we want to see that so our y final is zero, right? Um, our final y is this. But we need to know, it, is this expression greater than zero when the ball crosses the crossbar? OK, so this time is when the ball is crossing over the crossbar or should be crossing over the crossbar at least. And when we plug that into this expression, right, that's going to give us the y position, right? And that position needs to be greater than zero for the kicker to successfully make the field goal, OK? Um, so we know all these parameters. We know um, the distance d or, or the distance x final, which is 36 meters, right? That's 36 meters away uh, to over here. Um, we know that we fired this projectile at 20, uh, at 20 meters per second. And we know that the angle was at, uh, was at 55 degrees. Okay. Um, so we can plug those in and we get that when the ball arrives at the horizontal position of the cross crossbar, it is 0.157 meters off the ground. OK, which is good. That means that we clear the crossbar by about 16 centimeters. So it's close, but we made it. So the kicker will be successful in this instance. Um, so again, right, keep in mind the context, right? Since we shifted everything down, right? This is not the actual height off the ground, right? That an observer would see watching this in real time, right? This is just by how much we clear the crossbar by, right? Um, the actual height of the, of the ball, if you were looking at it in real time, would be 3.57 meters, right? Because you have to boost ourselves up to three meters again. So again, right, this is under, this is where understanding the context of what you're doing your problem in and how you've changed the problem to make it easier for yourself can affect the final answer, right? Um, you know, the problem here just asked if if the kicker will be successful. And so we successfully answered that question. But if they wanted to know, well, by how much did they make make it over the crossbar by? You know, what is the height of the football when the ball crosses over the crossbar, right? There's variations to this problem that can ask, that, that are basically the same, but, but end up with a slightly final end answer. So you do need to be aware of that. Um, so next problem, a ball is launched at angle theta sub i. Another ball is dropped from a height h. Show that if the launched ball is aimed at the dropped ball, the two balls will collide. Um, so this is a pretty uh, famous demo that's done in most physics classes, um, if you're taking a class in person or even online, possibly. Um, so we've got our diagram here, right? So we're going to have some ball that we're going to launch, right? And, the, and we're going to launch it aiming at the red ball over here, okay? When we launch this blue ball, the red ball is going to start falling, okay? Um, so in order for the balls to hit, we need t1 to equal t2. That is, that is a given, right? Time in the x and the y equations is always the same, assuming that you set your equations up properly, 
um, and, and we will. But so, so this is true. Um, we need the x final of the first ball to equal the x final of the second ball. And then we need the y of the first ball to equal the y of the second ball, okay, at, at the contact point, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to treat the balls as point particles. Uh, what this means is that the balls don't have a radius. They're infinitesimally small, and we don't take into account the fact that this thing actually has some radius. Um, we're just assuming that they're that they're points that are moving. Um, so so for ball number one, we have our equations of motion here, right? So we have our usual minus one half gt squared plus plus v naught sine theta t for our y. Um, and ball one, by the way, we are referring to the blue ball here. So this is number one, and this is number two. Um, and so then, uh, so we have that, and then we have the x1, right? So we have our x component. Um, for ball two, right, we have a similar equation, except that we don't have any initial velocity, right? We're just dropping it. So there is no uh, velocity term, but we do have an additional term for the fact that we are starting this distance hi off the ground, okay? And we'll call that y initial of two. Uh, we also know what our final x position is, right? We're not moving, we're just dropping it. So there's no horizontal velocity that we have to deal with. Um, so xf is always gonna be the x position of this dropped ball, okay? Um, so using this equation right here, we can solve for the time um, that it takes for the ball to reach xf, okay? Um, so we can solve for that. And since we know that this ball two is always gonna be at x at xf, we just, we're just we gonna find what time it takes for the ball to get here at xf, okay? Since we, then, since we found that time, right, we need to see if at that same time, if the two heights match up, okay? So we know that at some point the position that their x positions are going to be the same, but are the y positions at that same time also going to be the same? Okay, it's not enough for the x positions to just be the same, the y positions need to be the same as well. Um, so for the first ball, we're going to plug in our time here into both of these, right? Um, and then we're also going to plug it into the um, into the y equation, okay? And so we're going to set these two things equal to each other and we're going to see if if they end up being the same okay uh first thing you'll notice right is that these two terms are going to cancel out okay and so you're going to be left with um this uh y term and this term over here okay and so you get that this um y i of 2 Okay, which is also hi. Okay, this is equal to um, yi of two, right? Is equal to this um, v sine theta times x final position over over the initial velocity uh, times the cosine of theta, right? And then you can simplify this, right? The the v's are going to cancel, and then this becomes a tangent, right? So we have this y initial position of the second ball up here is equal to the final position times the tangent of theta, okay? And so now the question becomes, is this true? Is it true that the initial height of the second ball is equal to the horizontal distance times the tangent of theta, okay? Well, let's take a look at our diagram a little bit more closely here and see what we can find, okay? So we're trying to prove that this is true, right? And so if we look at our diagram here, we notice that we sort of have a triangle here, right? This is, our triangle, okay? And it has an angle, theta sub i right here, okay? It has a height hi, and it has a side length of xf, okay? And so the tangent of theta i, right, is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, okay? And so the opposite from our angle over here, right, is hi. And then our adjacent is xf. Okay, which is also equal to the y initial position of our second ball. 
over xf, okay? And so you recognize that if I move the xf over here and I multiply this, you are going to get xf tangent of theta is equal to the y initial position of ball two. So this statement is indeed true, okay? Therefore, the two balls do indeed collide. That is indeed true. They will collide. Um, and that's, that is pretty cool. Um, that, that if you launch something, um, at the same time as something is falling, if you're aimed correctly, the two things will collide. That's pretty neat. And not only did we, and we proved it mathematically, right? We just, we didn't just run the experiment, but we also proved that mathematically that should be the end result. Um, so I like this problem because, right, you have to keep track of two different objects, right? You gotta be, so you gotta be careful with the variables that you're using. And then you also gotta pull out your geometry skills um, to show that there is an equivalence between one variable and another variable um, that isn't necessarily super obvious. Um, so overall, a pretty fun problem. Okay, so now we are going to return to a question that I proposed at the end of the last video. Find the maximum displacement for any object undergoing projectile motion on flat ground, okay? And when, I, and when I say flat ground, I mean that, right, our projectile is starting on flat ground and is ending up at the same point, right? So our y initial is equal to our y final, so that the range equation that we derived in the last episode is the same, right? Um, so let me go all the way back, right? So we were, we were working on this, right? And we ended up coming up with that the displacement, right, would be the greatest at five, and then four, and then three, and then two, and then one, right? So the greatest displacement was five, and the next greatest was four, and the next greatest was three, right? But I said that that was only true if the range was greater than the maximum height. And then I kind of challenged you to see, yo, hey, maybe you should try this yourself and, and see what you come up with, right? Little did I know what I was uh, asking of you possibly. Um, so if you, if you attempted this, um, I, I applaud you. Um, but turns out it is vastly more complicated than what I initially had thought. Um, so, so how I first started thinking about this, right, is I was like, okay, well, what is the angle at which the maximum height and the range are the same, right? And so we actually um, solved that um, earlier in this video, um, all the way back here uh, for our first problem, right? So, so, so we figured that answer out again, right? And so when the angle is less than the arctan of four, um, R is greater than H. Otherwise, H is greater than R, right? Um, so um, if uh, tangent inverse of four is less than theta, which is less than pi over two, right? H is greater than R. So I was thinking like, okay, there must be some sort of like crossover point here, right? This this must be some sort of like critical point or inflection point where, where our answer is going to change, right? We're gonna go from, you know, the five is greater than four is greater than three to possibly like a four is greater than five, which is greater than three. Or something like that. Or, or that, that. That was kind of what my my intuition was telling me. Um, it turns out it, that, is that it is more complicated than that, even. Um, so what I ended up doing is that we have our range equation, we have our height, okay? And so in order to find the displacement, what we have to do is we need to find the magnitude of that vector, right? And so the magnitude of our vector is um, of our displacement vector is the equation for the x position squared plus the equation for the y position squared. Okay, and you got to take the square root of that. So that's the that's the magnitude of our displacement vector. Okay, and so then 
I need to know where this value is maximized or minimized, right? And so in order to do that, we want to find the derivative and then set it equal to zero to see if we can find new critical points, right? Um, so using um, uh, Wolfram Alpha and Mathematica, um, we get this expression for the derivative with respect to time. And then you set it equal to zero and you get this big weird thing, okay? And at this point, I started, it was it was hard to visualize what was going on. I was getting confused, right? And so I ended up just plotting a bunch of stuff on one graph. And so I'm gonna pull that up here now. Um, and I will show you what I ended up discovering here, okay? Okay, so we get the errors, but we'll change this here in a second. So let's uh, put all these on here. And so we're gonna set our velocity to maximum, right? We'll put our acceleration due to gravity in here at negative 9.8, we'll put it as an exact number. And we'll do this, okay? Uh, let's see, the graphs are kind of small here, so let's blow these up. Um, okay. Um, so first thing, over here on the right, we have our graph of y versus x, right? So how the the motion would look to you as an observer actually throwing a projectile, okay? The second graph is y versus time. And then over here on the left is our conglomeration of a bunch of different graphs, okay? So the first one is the displacement. Uh, so the orange line on this graph right here is the displacement. So that is this plotted... Um, so, so that is that plotted. Um, then we have the purple curve here, which is the derivative of the displacement. So that is this function right here. We then have the y versus time graph. So that is the same graph here, just in a different color. Okay, and then the scaling is also a little bit different over here on the left because we have other graphs. So keep that in mind. That doesn't look exactly the same, but it is the same curve. Then we have the derivative with respect to time of this y versus t graph. Okay, and then we have this horizontal blue line, which is the maximum range, right? So the maximum range, right, is, you know, where it hits the ground over here on our y versus x graph. Okay, um, so this graph over here on the left is the one that we're going to want to look at the most. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna make this larger so that everybody can get a clear view of what's going on. Okay. So we have our initial velocity, we just set that to 10. We have our acceleration due to gravity at negative 9.8. And then we'll be moving our t oh my gosh, that completely changed everything. Um hopefully I won't do that anymore. Okay. So Let's set our theta to pi over four, okay? So this is where our range is at its maximum value, okay? So a couple things that we wanna notice here right away, right? Is that where this is, since this red line is the derivative of y versus t, where this crosses zero is the maximum height of our y versus t graph. So that's when the maximum height is reached for our projectile, okay? Um, the derivative here of the displacement, right? If if the derivative of our displacement ever gets to zero, we know there's a critical point there where we potentially have a maximum, okay? Um, and so that's what we're looking for. And then when our displacement, and then the, the blue line helps us determine when our displacement is equal to our maximum range, okay? Because theoretically we should um, yeah, 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 never mind. Ignore what I was about to say. That was going to be incorrect. Okay. So right now we are at theta equals pi over four. Okay. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to gradually start to move theta upwards. Okay. So I'm increasing theta, right? We'll increase t a little bit here so we can see when, uh, when the ball hits the ground, right? So I start gradually increasing it, right? And, and what you'll notice is that this derivative graph is starting to approach closer to our our, our 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 red our red graph here. Okay. So that's the first thing you want to notice, right? 
And so we continue to increase, we continue to increase, right? And then you sort of start to notice that our, our displacement graph is like, it's increasing, then it's like not increasing as much. And then it kind of like levels out and then it starts increasing again, right? And then it starts to increase and then all of a sudden it hits our maximum range and then the ball hits the ground, right? And we don't care about everything else that happens after that. So we keep going up in theta, right? And then at some point, our derivative of the displacement hits zero for the first time, okay? So what that means, right, is that you can see that our displacement starts to level off, right? It reaches, uh, it changes at zero momentarily before it starts to increase again until we hit the maximum range, right? And so for all of these theta values that I've showed you so far, what I said in that first video holds, right? That five, when our ball hits the ground, all the way here, all the way over here, is where the displacement is at its maximum value. That, that still holds, okay? Now, as we continue to increase theta, right, we continue to increase, right? Eventually, our derivative dips dips below, um, dips below, and we now have two critical points, right? We have a maximum um, somewhere over here, and we have a minimum somewhere over here, okay? But our, 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 our maximum displacement is still occurring over here at the maximum range when our ball hits the ground. However, there is a spot, eventually as we increase theta, where right there, we actually have two moments in time where the displacement is equal to the maximum range. The range is, the displacement is equal to the range at two different spots in time, okay? It's equal over here at the end where the ball hits, where the ball hits the ground, but it's also equal at some point here on our curve as well. Sometime, so it's after we hit the maximum height, right? Because our maximum height is back here. So at some point, so at some point over here, we also have a, we have, so we have two places where the maximum displacement occurs. I, I found this fascinating, right? I was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. We got two places. So, so there is some special angle that if we launch our projectile at with these, with, with this acceleration, this velocity, where the ball will be the farthest away from us at two different points in time. I, I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then as I continue to increase, increase theta, right, then we have a critical point here where we have a maximum that is above the range, right? Uh, we now have a point that's above the range and we go back to only having one point where there is a maximum displacement, but that point is not when the ball hits the ground, it is at some point in midair, you know, some point after our maximum height, but some, but somewhere before we hit the ground. Okay. And then as I continue to increase theta, right, you'll notice that the derivative curve here of the displacement and the derivative curve of the y versus t graph, it get, they get closer and closer together until the displacement graph at pi over two becomes the y versus t graph. And the derivative graph is just the derivative of the y versus t graph, right? And at pi over two is when the maximum height becomes the place where our displacement is the, is the maximum, okay? So, so that makes, makes sense, right? Is that when we just throw the ball straight up in the air, right? When it hits that maximum height is where the maximum displacement is. Um, so, so, so yeah, so I found this interesting, um, you know, that there is this magical angle where there are two spots where the displacement is at a maximum. And so I, I tried to find what this angle was. Okay. Um, but my attempts were in vain, unfortunately. Um, the, the, the math is not fun. Um, what you end up getting is you end up getting a, um, a, a quintic, um, a fourth degree polynomial. Okay. And since you have, um, a, a Y intercept in your equation that is equal to the range. Okay. It's not just like an X to the fourth plus an X to the, it's not a T to the fourth plus a B T to the third plus a C T to the second, right. Is equal to zero, right. Something that would seemingly be easy to solve. You have this extra extra constant, right? You have this y-intercept term in there, right? 
And if you've ever looked at the um, equation, like so there's like a, there's a quadratic equation, right, for, for two degree polynomials, but there's also an equation for four degree polynomials, right? Um, the, the quintic equation. And that is not a nice thing to look at. Um, it is not for the faint of heart. And I was not gonna dig through that. I was already like four hours deep into this problem at this point. Um, and so uh, if you wanna go through it and, and attempt to, to do, do it yourself, you sure can, and you are welcome to. I'd be interested if you if you find um, an, an analytical solution. But I, I resonated myself to just accept, okay, there is some angle where there are two moments in time where the maximum displacement exists. And and that was cool. And that was cool enough for me. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, um, just some other quick observations, right? Is that, you know, the derivative hits, uh, hits zero right here, right? Um, so there's like a maximum like right here, right? But that's not a global maximum. That is a local maximum, right? So that's also tricky. Um, if you are trying to do this purely mathematically is that you have to be aware of what your domain is, first of all, right? That we only care about times up until like 1.4 seconds, right? But that also there are some spots where there's a local maximum that is not the global maximum on the domain that we're on, right? Like, you know, the, the, the global maximum is actually the range, right? Um, and for, for certain angles. So there's so many factors that are built into this problem here. Um, you know, again, I found it really interesting, right? I think that, you know, especially for some of my more advanced viewers out there, uh, I think you, I think you appreciate this, right? And that you can take what seemed like a simple problem and you dove into it and it turned out to be really complex. And there's a lot of interesting niche cases as a result of this. Um, so, so it definitely was cool to dive into. Um, and so you can probably understand now why is, why I was saying that if you attempted this yourself, right, you were going to be in for a difficult time because the only solutions that I really found were graphical solutions. They weren't even analytical solutions. So, um, so going back to our original, uh, our, our original question, um, find the maximum, uh, displacement for any object are undergoing projectile motion on flat ground. Right. What I still, what I said in the first video holds true when the range is greater than the maximum height. Um, but once that's no longer true, right? Um, and, and, and even a little bit before, like, like even when, even once the height starts to get close to that maximum range, right? It's no longer true, uh, even. So, um, so, so there's not a good solid answer, right? I, I, I mean, and, and this point four moves around. It moves closer to three and it moves closer to five, right? Sometimes it is at five, right? And sometimes it is at three. Oh, and for and for a specific angle, it's at three. But it, but you know, it it at this point will will we'll move around where the maximum displacement is. So it's a depends on the situation answer, which um, isn't necessarily something we have in physics very often, where it depends. So there you go. Um, so moving on, um, moving on from that problem, um, that was quite an interesting one. Um, we're going to talk about fish. Um, I like fish. I like eating it. Uh, but let's see how they swim. Uh, salmon are able to move through the water faster because they porpoise. So what I mean by this, right, is that they like they swim underwater, right, and then they like jump out of the water and then they like keep swimming under the water. Okay. Uh, suppose a salmon swimming in the water jumps out with velocity six meters per second squared, uh, six meters per second at 45 degrees. Then sails for then sails. So sails meaning like sit is in the air um, for a distance L before swimming a distance L underwater at 3.5 meters per second before jumping out again. Determine the average velocity for one cycle. Okay. So we have our little drawing here, right? So we have our distance L here. We have a distance L there. This is our uh, time that we're out, right? And so we're looking for what is the average velocity from here to here? Okay. So our average velocity is the total distance that we travel divided by the total time that it takes. Okay. The total distance that we're going is 2L. And then the total time that we're going is the time that we spent sailing. So the time here, or yeah, or, I mean, I mean, TS is actually the time swimming. So TS is the time that we swim here. 
and then TP is the time that we porpoise and is the time that we're in the air here, okay? Um, so the time that we're swimming is L over the velocity of swimming, and the time that we porpoise is the total distance L, and, the, and L is the horizontal distance, divided by our uh, porpoising velocity times the cosine of theta because we care about the horizontal component, right? Because L is a horizontal distance. And so it's at this point, right, they are thinking like, okay, so the next step would be, okay, well, what is L? We need to figure out what L is, right? And so I'll throw up the equation. Um, I'm not going to tell you what L is, though. And you're going to see why in a second. So the average, right, is going to be 2L over and L over V sub, v sub S plus L over V sub P cosine of theta. You're going to find a common denominator and you're going to smash these two fractions together. Okay, so then you get something like this. And then you take this, you plop it up top, and you're left with that thing on the bottom, right? So we're just kind of, we're just manipulating this fraction, right? We, we got a, like a something, something, and then something, so then this something comes up top, right? Okay. Um, and so once you get here, right, if you have a keen eye, you can see that you can factor out an L out of the bottom and an L out of the top and they will cancel. So what does that mean? It means that the distance that we swim or porpoise does not matter for the average velocity of this problem. That is correct. The distance that we swim or porpoise does not affect the outcome of the problem. It, it, might, it might seem crazy to you, but this is what the math said. So that's why I didn't calculate L. I was, I, I was going through the problem, and I was like, well, don't I need to calculate L at some point? Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Nope, it doesn't matter. Let's see this some work. Um, so once you factor up L, you get this nice little expression over here, at which point you can then plug in our numbers, right? We know the velocity for swimming. We know the velocity of porpoising. We know our angle. You can plug all that in. That turns out that our average velocity is 3.836 meters per second. Okay. Um, which is pretty good. Um, it's greater than the three and a half for our swimming velocity. Um, it's definitely quite a bit less than our uh, porpoising velocity, right? But again, these are fish, right? They're not meant to, you know, be in the air, right? They're not birds. They don't fly, right? But uh, but they do do that. Um so, so that's an interesting answer, right? It doesn't depend on the distance. It just depends on the velocity and the angles. So very cool. There's one thing, though, that I do want to bring up before this, right, is that this situation is very unrealistic, right? Because as soon as you hit the water, you all of a sudden start going horizontal, right? So that would be a large amount of force and acceleration on that fish. And I'm not sure if the fish is surviving that. So um, the, the path here, well, semi- realistic is definitely not plausible so um yeah it's definitely an idealistic situation that we propose to solve this problem um so then we have our last problem problem number seven um seven's my lucky number so i've decided i'm going to try to limit these videos to seven problems and find the find the seven problems that i think are the most interesting um so this is gonna be the last one for this episode um a ski jumper leaves a ramp with some initial velocity at an angle theta the ski jumper will land on an incline with an angle phi. Find the distance from the end of the ramp to the place where the jumper lands on the incline and find the velocity as the jumper lands. Okay. So we got going on here, right? So, so let's start with the drawing, right? And let's understand what's going on down here, right? So this is our angle phi, first of all, right? That is the angle of our incline, okay? And that's with respect to the horizontal. We have our angle theta and we have our angle and we have our initial velocity and we have our angle theta okay um the edge of the ramp that we're jumping off of ends at zero zero right so we're gonna go re and then we're gonna like land someplace down here okay um what's not obvious but is implied in the problem is that your downward like ramp starts also at zero zero right the incline that you're landing on starts at zero zero and goes downwards right that is something that if you read the problem is not necessarily obvious right um some people might think that like oh the incline like starts out over here right and you go like we like over here right and that's not true um 
you could set up the problem to take that into account, but it's going to be more difficult. So for the sake of this problem, it's not stated, at, but that is what the incline is like. Okay. So we have our equation for the projectile. We have our equation. Uh, so we have our y equation for the projectile. We have our x equation for the projectile. We also have the y equation for our ramp. Okay. Now this is, I'm going to throw up a bait warning here. Okay. This is a big warning. Okay. Since our angle phi is between zero and two pi, or and pi over two, sorry. Um, you need to put the negative sign here. You have to put the negative sign here. If you don't put the negative sign here, you will get the wrong answer, okay? Plain and simple. The reason why is that, right, our plane is going downwards into the fourth quadrant. This has a negative y value here, okay? Right, if you don't put the negative sign there, it's gonna be like your ramp went like this, okay? And that our, and that our skier went like, right, like this, right? That is not the problem that we are solving, okay? So make sure to put your negative sign there. It is an easy mistake to make, and I've seen many people do it, and I almost made that same mistake when I was doing this. So take your time and make sure for the negative sign there. <laughs> uh, and so then that, the x position, right, is, is just d, d cosine phi. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. Um, but again, this is where setting up the problem matters, right? Because you could leave out the negative sign if you plugged in the angle like this, right? Like if our if our angle went all the way around, right? Then you could plug it in, right? But 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 we're taking phi again to be from zero to pi over two, right? So you got this is where you need to be smart. Well, I I maybe mean, smart as it, but you need to understand the context of what's going on in order to properly set up what's going on. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to set the uh, y of the projectile equal to the y of the ramp. And we're going to do the same for x. Okay. Um, so we've got two equations um, here. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide these equations. Okay. So we're going to divide y, uh, the y ramp equation by the, by the x ramp equation and the y projectile equation by the x projectile equation. The reason why this is nice is because it's going to get rid of our d's. Okay, and it's going to give us a tangent of phi is equal to um, a bunch of stuff that depends on theta and t. Okay. Um, so then what we're going to do is that we're just going to do some algebraic manipulation, right? We're going to move this to this side. Um, and then we're going to add this back over to this side. Uh, you'll notice that there's a t in each term, so we can factor out a t. Okay. Um, it's now equal to zero because we added this term over to this side. Um, so then we can use the zero product property, right? So we've got two terms, one multiplied equals zero. So in order to get that to happen, right, the first term can be zero. So T can be equal to zero, which is cool, but also the stuff inside can be equal to zero. Okay. And so, um, we know that T equals zero is not the solution that we're looking for, right? Cause that would mean that our jumper never actually jumped. Uh, which wouldn't be very interesting. Um, and D would be equal to zero. So we want um, a different uh, a different solution. Um, so we get this right here. And um, when you when you rearrange and solve, um, so you can take uh, this uh, this GT term, right? You can add it over. Then you can multiply by two, divide by divide by G. This should be a positive, uh, by the way. I just realized, and you can get um, that. Uh, so then you get this right here. Okay, with a little bit of algebraic manipulation, you get that the time is equal to this conglomerate of theta ter of thetas, v's, and v's and g's. Okay, so interesting, somewhat. Um, but then we want to find out well, well, what is d, right? What is what what is the distance of this like ramp here, right? That that we that we go. Uh, oh my goodness, 
uh, a little weird. Uh, so then we want to figure out this distance t. And so we're going to use our x equation because it's a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so where you get v times the time final times the cosine of theta over the cosine of phi is the distance d. And so it's so you might be wondering like, okay, is this really? Yeah, uh, does this make sense, right? And the answer is okay. Let's take an extreme case, right? Let's say that phi is zero, right? If phi was zero, our ramp would just be out across the x-axis, okay? So it'd be like landing on flat ground then. And and so when cosine of phi of zero, that's equal to one, okay? So that means that we just end up with the numerator, which is vt cosine of theta. And that should look pretty familiar, right? Because that's how we can get the final x position. Um, on, right? That's how we, we can get the final x position. So that makes sense. That, that totally checks out, right? That is, that makes sense. That would be how we get the distance on flat ground in the x direction. So cool. So, so, that, so that means that we did something right, right? And that means that our answer is plausible, okay? And in this case, it is the right answer. So that's always, that's always a plus two. Um, and then part B was to find the velocity, um, because this time is pretty, is pretty ugly, right? Um, I just kind of just left some TFs in here and then you can find the magnitude, right? By taking your X component squared plus the Y component squared. It, it's nothing super revolutionary. Okay. Um, the other thing that we can do, right, is if we set phi to zero, right, the tangent, um, goes to zero. So your time T, right, is two V um, sine theta um, over G. So um, that also um, is, uh, it, it, it's different, but it, it, it checks out. Um, and, and so that's so right, like the tangent of phi, right? Sine of of zero is zero divided by one, right? That's zero. So this whole term right here is zero and you would get to be sine theta over G um, for, for the time. So there's that. Um, but with that being said, that was our last problem. And so um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, you know, I think that there was a good mix of like more advanced problems, right? With like the, with like graphically having to plot things to come up with a solution, and then just some straight up mathematical um, mathematical analyzing and some analytical solutions. Um, so as always, I'd appreciate if you like, comment, and subscribe. Um, if you have any questions um, about any of the problems, if you think if you have some more details, or you think that you found something that I might have missed, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to respond. Um, now, with that being said, I will see you in the next episode where we will be talking about forces. So I'll see you in the next one.